Mark Sawatka is the General Secretary of the PCS Union, the union that represents civil servants and uh, civil servants that have been going on strike across the country in recent months. Over the next bit of time, we're going to be talking about the industrial action that his union has been engaged in. Obviously, we're in this unprecedented wave of industrial action, at least for a generation. And uh, there are some big disputes that people are very, very familiar with, the rail disputes, the NHS disputes, uh, the disputes that your union is engaged in, some of our viewers may be slightly less familiar with. Um, so I wondered if you could talk our viewers through what the big issues uh, are in your dispute at the moment. So... Uh, we represent civil and public servants, and so that is people who work directly for government um, and in public bodies that are funded by government. We represent some of the lowest paid workers in the UK. Um, and the reason we're in dispute is very similar to colleagues in other unions. We've been offered a 2% pay award when inflation, as we know, is running in excess of 10 to 11%. We've had 10 years of pay offers below the rate of inflation, so much so that to give you view as an example, our workers who work in tax offices, 30% now of the entire workforce of tax offices are on the national minimum wage. That is because their pay has been suppressed for 10 consecutive years. So we've got a 2% pay offer. We're demanding 10%. But in addition, the government is still threatening to cut up to 90,000 civil service jobs, even though most people recognise we need more jobs to provide frontline services. They're forcing people to pay too much money for their pension every single month, 2%. We're paying too much, um, according to an independent valuer. And finally, at a time they're threatening to make 90,000 job cuts, they want to cut the redundancy terms that people are contractually entitled to by a staggering 33%. So it's an existential set of issues that frontline public sector workers are facing here. Um, and that is why we voted to strike by a historic high vote in the civil service. 87% of people voted to strike. So uh, you've, you've, your union has been engaged in a number of different uh, days of strike action over the last few months. People probably most remember the border guards strikes that took place over Christmas. Um, but you've announced a, a major strike day on March 15th to coincide with the budget where over 100,000 civil servants will be going out on strike. Why have you chosen to escalate the campaign in that way? So essentially the government are giving us the same story that they're giving all other workers, which is that there's no money on the table and they're not prepared to reopen the pay from 2022. And, and that is completely unacceptable. So our tactic has been to have everybody out on strike. So we were out on the 1st of February alongside hundreds of thousands of teachers, train workers um, and college lecturers. But before that, we've run a series of targeted sustained strikes, bringing people out for extended periods. So you're right, we've had the border force out over Christmas at the airports, but we've also had DWP workers out in the Northwest and we've got another 20 days of action there. We've had strikes in the DVLA, the people who issue driving licenses, strikes of driving examiners, strikes in the DEFRA area. So next week we've got the Animal Plant Agency out on strike. We've had the Rural Payments Agency out on strike. And we've now announced everyone out on the 15th of March, but also further strikes in the border force, in the ports um, that serve Dover, um, more strikes in the DWP. The British Museum will be out on strike all of next week, meaning that the British Museum is likely to be closed and in London. And this is part of escalating our action to increase the pressure. So the 15th of March, we chose, number one, because it's budget day, and many of the civil servants involved in supporting the government to deliver the budget will be on strike, including people in the cabinet office, including people in Downing Street. And if we win our reballot, every single member in the tax office. So industrially, it's an important day for the civil service. There will be picket lines literally at the bottom of Downing Street when the chancellor leaves Downing Street to drive across to Parliament. So it'll be a very eye-catching, significant industrial day. But also... We know that the teachers are out on strike on the 15th of March, and we're hoping again to see lots of workers come together to make it clear to the government that we're not giving up and we're prepared to escalate if we have to. And so in terms of making it clear to the government, um, obviously you're seeking a resolution to this. Your members don't want to be on strike. You don't want to be asking your members to take industrial action. Um, 
Do you have any update in terms of where talks and negotiations have got to? Do you think there's any prospect of an agreement close on the horizon? No. Um, and I'm blunt with that question because the government is playing a silly game. Um, we, we can see that wherever the government is not directly involved, progress has been made. So if you look in Scotland and in Wales, for example, we'll see that the Welsh and Scottish government have increased their pay offers. And we are expecting a significantly approved offer from the civil service in Scotland, for example. We've seen that in a health service, better offers in Scotland and in Wales, and action has been suspended. We saw last week the firefighters receive, receive a much improved offer because of their strike vote, essentially negotiating with local authorities. But where Westminster is in charge, so that's for the health service in England and Wales. Uh, so, for example, we, you know, we see paramedics and nurses, train workers where the companies are clearly being instructed by the government to block a settlement. Very little progress has been made, and that's the same for us. So we get invited to meetings. The famous door is open, we're told. We walk through the door to find there's no one there. There's nothing on the table. And they keep saying things to us like, we've closed pay for 2022. We'll be imaginative in 2023. Well, frankly, our members don't want imagination and creativity. They need money on the table, and they need it now. For, for civil servants, if we waited for this year's pay, people wouldn't get it until the summer. The reality is there is in-work poverty now. I don't know if you know, Chris, but 40,000 civil servants are using food banks and 45,000 civil servants claim in-work benefits, many of whom administer those benefits in our job centres because they are the in-work poor. So we can't wait for creativity in the summer. We need hard cash on the table now. And at the moment, the government is saying no. And that's why the strikes are escalating. So just to move a little bit uh, broader on the kind of wider context of, the, of this dispute and the action that your union is engaged in, um, obviously you were a you were a general general secretary of the PCS in the early 2010s when there was the kind of last major massive upsurge in um, in disputes with the, the the pension dispute being the big one. Um, this this uh, set of action that a range of unions are engaged in feels different. It feels like this is uh, that that the, well, firstly that that unions are are fighting and they're really winning, like the FBU have, like uh, Unite are across the country and others. Um, but also the scale of it appears to be and feels much bigger, and the public uh, support for the industrial action appears to be uh, that much stronger than it was in the early 2010s as well. Um, what's your assessment of what this wave industrial action means? For for the trade union movement, not just in the short term for your members and the pay that's in their pocket and their conditions, um, but for the trade union movement and its power and strength in, in the economy and society more broadly? Well, that's a great question. And I think you, you, you correctly identify this is very different to 2011. Uh, our, our union was one of the instigators of the 2011 mass strike. We took action in the June of that year alongside teachers and lecturers over pensions for unions. Some attacked us at the time, including the leader of the Labour Party was attacking people for going on strike over pensions. Um, but, but our action directly resulted in 29 unions and 2 million people being on strike in the November of that year. The problem with that is that I think some unions went into that dispute very much seeing it as the famous quote was, people need to let off steam. And it was a one-off gesture that faded away. And in fact, it was only PCS unite um, and I think one other union who carried that strike on past the 2011. This is different. This is different because essentially we've got a series of separate disputes, all caused by the same reason, the cost of living crisis, both in the public and private sector that have their own dynamics. Unite have won some stunning victories. In, in my own union, we have private sector members working in the disclosure and bar, barring service employed by Hinduja Global Systems. They, they are billionaires, the Hinduja brothers. And they were on strike for six weeks and they won a stunning victory where they achieved a much, much higher pay rise because they were prepared to go on strike. So where employers are often left their own devices, the power of the workforce is winning. Where the government still is in charge, they are desperately trying for political reasons to not make concessions. But of course, we all know this government is weak, mired in catastrophe, has no real mandate, has crashed the economy. And I think the reason these strikes are so significant is they enjoy immense public support. I mean, I've been a general secretary for two decades. I've never seen opinion polling that supports strikes the way that it is now. 
And although the NHS strikes are the most important, even civil service strikes, that people don't often know what civil servants do, you still find 40% of people strongly support the strike. I think that's because everybody's suffering. Everybody can see the government's incompetent. Everybody's paying huge energy bills, sees inflation going through the roof, and people have had enough. So I think these strikes are winnable. I personally believe it's a matter of time before we win significant concessions right across the board because of the government's weakness and because of the strength of our case. And long term for the unions, this could be such a significant moment. The NEU recruited 41,000 new members in under three weeks. In my own union, our membership is now higher than at any time since the Tories stopped us deducting union dues from people's pay packets in order to try to bankrupt the union. We are growing at a rate we've never seen before, but also more people are becoming active. And the picket lines, Chris, that we had on the 1st of February were an absolute joy to be at. They were young, they were diverse, they were full of people being on strike for the first time who, if I can put it this way, were enjoying the fact that they felt liberated and were prepared to fight back. Some of the spontaneity on picket lines, you could see the people felt empowered. And I think when that genie's out of the box, they cannot be put back in. So I think now we have to keep fighting and winning. And I've always believed when working class people come together and win, that gives them the power to fight for more and more, and it can be actually quite transformational. And I hope that is where we are going to go. I very much hope so. And I think the conditions are very promising. So I wanted to ask you about the minimum service levels bill and the anti-strikes law that's currently going through Parliament. But but I had a quick question for you before that, based on what you said at the beginning um, of that response. Um, so you mentioned that in the 2011 disputes, the, the Labour leader criticised the trade union movement. Uh, in the current context, we have this um, uh, biggest wave of strike action for a generation. Um, I think it wouldn't be it wouldn't be uncharitable to say that the Labour leadership's position on these strikes has been tepid at best. What do you make of uh, the Labour Party's position uh, on these disputes? Well, I think it's tragic that history seems to be repeating itself. That um, we have a Labour leadership, I think, that believes it's going to win, but believes it's going to win because of the unpopularity of the government rather than itself presenting, I think, a fairly bold and radical programme. And, and I believe that is a massive missed opportunity because Keir Starmer's popularity, in my view, amongst working people would go through the roof if he got off the fence and stopped just saying the Tories should negotiate and say where he stood. If he came out and said, no worker in Britain, whether public or private sector, should be poorer at the end of the year than they were at the start, through no fault of their own because of cost of living crisis, People would think that here's a man who's actually got some convictions and he's prepared to talk about them. So I think that their position actually is a massive missed opportunity. But I take some comfort from the fact that we've had loads of progressive MPs on our picket lines. And they, they've they been, so Caroline Lucas supports our picket lines, the SNP have been on our picket lines, so applied Cymru, but so have a core of Labour MPs, those who are ignoring the instruction to stay away. You know, not, not just the old guard like John McDonnell and Jeremy Corbyn, although now he's not officially a Labour MP, but the new breeds, Zara Zoltana, Bel Ribeiro Adi, and many, many others have been standing with workers, and I think they get it. And I wish Keir Starmer uh, would actually get it, because... Waiting for an election to fall into your hands, I think, is a very dangerous game. I think you should fight for every vote and inspire people. And this is a missed opportunity. And so then finally, on the anti-strikes bill that's currently going through Parliament, um, there appears to be some disagreement within the trade union movement about the strategy to defeat this. So you've seen the TUC in particular talking about legal action. Um, I spoke to Matt Rack from the FBU a few weeks ago, and he expressed scepticism of that, about the, 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 the legal system being the mechanism to defeat the bill, and instead talked about mass mobilisation on the streets. How do you think the trade union movement can defeat this uh, pernicious piece of legislation? So I, I tend to take the view that you should try everything. You shouldn't try one thing and promote it necessarily over another or try one and wait and then take plan B. So I am in favour of taking legal action. You know, my, my own union has won, I think, eight high court victories over the government in the last five years. I think workers quite like it when you go to the courts. It's not in our interest to make illusions in the courts. And ultimately, we shouldn't put all our faith in that system, but we should try. Um, I saw the leaked emails from government 
part of the beauty of being a civil service union leader is you get lots of things fall into your lap. <laughs> and, and, I, and I can tell you that those emails made it clear the government considered three options. One was to completely ban trade unions in swathes of the public sector. Second one was to do a prison officer style ban on any right to strike in certain parts of the public sector. Thirdly was minimum service levels. And the staggering thing was they ruled out the first two because they didn't think they could legally get away with it. Not because they had any moral <laughs> concerns that it may be wrong. So when I see Grant Shapps saying, of course, we believe in the right to strike, Grant is lying. Grant Shapps is lying. He, he would have banned the strikes if he could thought he could get away with it. They know on minimum service levels, according to the briefings I've seen, that they're legally vulnerable. So we should fight it legally. But at the same time, we must also do mass mobilizations. We should get people on the streets. We should make clear the right to strike is critical. And it's not a coincidence that they're clamping down on it now when there's more strikes in Britain than many of us will have seen in decades and decades. So ultimately, the best way to defend the right to strike is to strike now and to win. And in striking, make it sure that all of our members understand that the Tories want to remove that right from them in very real terms, that a minimum service level is legally conscripting people and forcing them to work. It is actually giving people no rights whatsoever. So we need to be on the streets, yes. We need to make it a core of the mobilization that we're doing now and explaining to people that they're fighting now and winning, but the Tories want to take that right away from them. And we need to ensure that we make it very, very difficult for the government to believe it can get away with it. At the same time, fight legally in the courts. But thirdly, and I think this is equally importantly, we have to make sure that the Labour Party now gives unequivocal and very public commitments that were this to come in, they will not only oppose it, but they will repeal not just this legislation if they win the election, but they will actually repeal the legislation back from 2016. And I would like them to repeal all the anti-union laws. Because Chris, when I started work many moons ago with a benefit office in South Wales, we did not have to give notice have a 50% requirement, jump through hoop after hoop, workers could get together collectively, make a decision and could go out on strike. The scales have tipped now so massively in favour of employers that it's actually a miracle that so many unions are able to fight now. That is a cause of workplace organising and fighting hard battles. My own union, we tried twice to beat the threshold and failed. This was the third time we got over the line and it is hard work. When you're organizing in thousands of workplaces, if you don't have reps in the workplace, activists, lay activists on the ground, very, very difficult to win. So we've got to do everything we can. And my view is whatever option there is, don't choose one over another, do the lot. Legal action, mobilization. But if I could say one thing most importantly, win the strikes that we're involved in now and ensure the members understand they've won those strikes but they won't have the right to do that in the future unless we defeat this bill. So before I let you go, Mark, uh, could you just let our viewers know who many of them will be wanting to support PCS in these disputes, how they can they, they can show that support and solidarity? Yeah, uh, we would love loads of solidarity. People often think of civil servants and they think of bowler-hatted Sir Humphreys walking down Whitehall in tweed suits. And the reality is our members work in job centres, in courts, in tax offices, in borders, they are incredibly low paid, but they work in every single part of the UK. When we're on strike on the 15th of March, that will involve two and a half thousand workplaces in cities, in villages, in towns. We will have picket lines. We currently have on our website the ability for people to donate to our hardship fund. We have ways of people showing their support. My own view is the single most important thing people could do is get to a picket line, organize supportive meetings in towns, marches, and ensure that what we say, and I think this is a key point to finish, is there are no deserving and undeserving workers. There are no group of workers who deserve more than other. We all deserve, whether in the public or private sector, whether we're a nurse or a job center worker or work on the railways, to not be bullied at work, be threatened with job insecurity and have our cost of living cut. So in supporting PCS, I hope people also support the picket lines and disputes of the health workers, the train workers, the postal workers who've been fighting massively. And then if we do that, we won't just see one victory or we won't just see victories in some parts of the economy. We could see a real return 
to an upsurgent trade union and labor movement that is winning. And I think that is the best contribution that we could make for the future generation of trade unionists, for students and young people who will be going into the workplace. We need strong unions ensuring workplace justice and justice across the economy. So donate if you can, get to the picket lines, but most of all, support all the disputes that are taking place. And hopefully, Chris, on your show, uh, towards the middle and latter part of the year, we can be reviewing how this was the year when workers fought, they won, and now we're looking forward to improving our lot even more in the future. I'll definitely make sure to get you back on uh, when the PCS wins these disputes. Uh, Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Really enjoyed it. And sorry again for the technical glitch at the beginning. Cheers.